Lovely. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second uh, APG Salt Basins uh, seminar of the year. Uh, this week, we have the pleasure of having uh, Jesse thompson Job talk to us about uh, the Sinbad Valley dive here in the Paradox Basin. Uh, Jesse is currently a research geologist uh, looking at geological hazards, working at the Geological Hazard Science Center at the USGS, US Geological Survey, uh, where she focuses on understanding active faults and seismic hazards throughout the United States. Uh, her broader research interests seek to understand landscape evolution resulting from tectonics uh, over thousands to millions of years. Prior to working at the USGS, Jesse worked uh, on the Gulf of Mexico exploration team at ConocoPhillips as a postdoctoral researcher in salt tectonics at the University of Texas, uh, El Paso, and the Colorado School of Mines, as a postdoctoral research geologist at the USGS, and as a geologist at the US Bureau of Reclamation. Jesse has a BS in Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Science from MIT, and a PhD in Earth Science from the University of California, Santa Barbara. So with that, Jesse, I'll give the floor to you. Looking forward to your talk. Great, thank you. And, uh, and, and just a warning, there may be an appearance from my cat. She's circling me right now. So let's see. All right. Is that on the screen now? Yep. yep per perfect. Looks good. Great. Well, thanks for that introduction, Connor. Um, I'm very excited to be here today to share with you some of my research um, with the Salt Sediment Interaction Consortium Group at the University of Texas, El Paso um, on salt tectonics in the Paradox Basin. And today I'll be presenting an integrated case study of the Sinbad Valley dive here. So this is some work that was done back in 2016 through 2018 um, to really characterize one of the dive piers in the basin really well, and then try to see how we can apply some of those learnings to other dive piers throughout the paradox. And then before I begin, I want to acknowledge my wonderful co-authors on the project, um, Kate Giles, Thomas Heron, Mark Rowan, Bruce Trudgill, Evie Ganaway, and Zane Job, or Ganaway Dalton and Zane Job, um, who are all uh, really great co-authors on our, on our study that's now published in Geosphere, which I'll have at the end. All right, one sec. So I'm sure many of you have at least heard of the Paradox Basin, if not spent some time either recreating there or going on geology field trips. Um, it's pretty well known throughout the world for it's just absolutely beautiful exposures. Um, so here's a nice Google Earth image of some of those salt dye piers within the Paradox Basin. So we're, we're in southeastern Utah and southwestern Colorado um, in the United States here, and you can just see all of the, the beautiful exposures of these salt walls, the reds and, and uh, yellows and whites representing um, those uplifted uh, sedimentary units within the basin with these nice northwest, southeast trending linear valleys being those salt walls here. Um, so let's take a look at, at what that looks like from an oblique view. So now we are in a plain, kind of right over highway uh, 191, northwest of Moab looking to the southeast and again, we can just really see these beautiful exposures with the nice linear salt walls trending northwest, southeast, and then those upturned, um, or I should say those uplifted and sometimes upturned um, Permian, Pennsylvania Permian through Mesozoic stratigraphy on the flanks of those salt walls. So I'm sure many people have been to this area because it's right by Arches National Park and right by Moab and it's just a really um, fun place to explore the geology and some of the culture and recreating there. Um, but so if we take a look at a seismic line through Moab Valley and Salt Valley, so we're going from Southwest here to the Northeast here, and we can see that the pink here represents the salt. So we have these salt dive piers that are coming, these salt walls that are coming up to the surface. And then the purples through the greens represent the Pennsylvania and through the uh, Cretaceous stratigraphy that fill these mini basins between the salt walls and then sometimes truncate or upturn against the salt walls. Um, and so what we're trying to do is, and I'll explain this more in a few slides, is um, look at some of these geometries in the subsurface and combine it with some of the excellent exposure that we have in outcrop to try to understand a little bit more about the basin history. So a brief outline for the talk. Um, I will briefly go over the geologic setting of the Paradox Basin, 
I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but just to bring everyone on the same page. And then we'll discuss the research motivation. And we're gonna spend most of our time talking about some of the details that we're seeing at the Sinbad Valley Dye Pier. Um, and then we'll try to look at just a handful of observations from other dye piers in the Paradox Basin and maybe see what we can learn from, from that. So the Paradox Basin um, is a flexural foreland basin formed the, during the ancestral Rocky Mountain orogeny. As I said before, it's located in southeastern Utah and southwestern Colorado in the United States. Um, so to the northeast of the Paradox Basin, the Uncompahgre uplift uh, began to exhume in the late Pennsylvanian to Permian based on low temperature thermochronology data with ages of 320 to 260 million years ago. So that's represented by this stippled um, kind of northwest southeast trending oval shape here. And what that did is uh, created a flexural foreland basin to the southwest um, where Pennsylvanian salt was deposited during uh, numerous marine incursions, which led to the deposition of uh, evaporites at the base of the basin. And then subsequent uh, differential loading by Permian through Cretaceous sediments, um, some of that being uh, detritus shut off the rising Uncompahgre uplift, um, filled that basin and subsequently deformed that salt into these northwest southeast trending salt walls that we see here as these uh, pink elongate shapes. Um, so the outline of the Paradox Basin is also marked by, by this dash line here and filled with brown. That's the limit of the Paradox evaporate in the area. But the area that we're really going to be focused on is where it was deformed into these salt walls. Um, so that's located here with MB in the town of Moab and GW being the town of Gateway for those who've been there before and are familiar with it. So if you take a look at this area from, uh, from another data set, um, this is uh, gravity data now over that salt wall part of the Paradox Basin. Um, so the reds represent gravity highs and the blues represent gravity lows. And we can again see in the subsurface data that we have um, these northwest southeast trending linear salt walls. Um, and in addition on here, uh, these red lines represent basement faults that have been mapped in the, in the pre-Pennsylvanian strata down in the Mississippian and older strata. Um, and so we'll get back to that in just a second. Um, but if we take a look at those salt walls again and try to understand how it relates to the surface, what we're seeing at the surface, um, we can overlay a structural map here with the pink representing the location of those salt valleys. Um, and then if we remove the underlying gravity map, um, we can see that we have a number of different faults and, and folds that, uh, that are roughly subparallel to these northwest southeast trending salt walls. Um, and many of these faults are related to uh, much later, um, much later deformation events or uh, salt wall collapse, and not necessarily related to the uh, initiation of those and the growth of those salt walls. But some of them are, and we'll talk about that throughout the throughout the talk. So as I mentioned, the location of the salt walls appears to be controlled by the location of these basement faults. So if we take a cross section across the Paradox Basin, going from uh, northeast to southwest, so we're northeast on the right-hand side to southwest on the left-hand side, crossing a number of these salt walls, um, we can see that where we have these basement steps interpreted as the red dashed lines in the gravity map um, happens to coincide with the locations of those salt walls. And so it's thought that um, that pre-Pennsylvanian um, those pre-Pennsylvanian faults are what's influencing the location of those salt walls. So let's talk a little bit about the stratigraphy of the Paradox Basin. Um, so the Paradox Basin contains um, roughly Pennsylvanian through Cretaceous strata with a little bit of uh, tertiary and quaternary strata. The formations that we're most concerned with in this study are going to be the Paradox Formation, that's Pennsylvanian, that's noted by this pink color, which also represents salt throughout the, the talk. The Purple Honaker Trail, that's a unit that um, was deposited during marine conditions, commonly contains uh, carbonates and siliciclastics, uh, fine grain siliciclastics, and sometimes some conglomerates, pebble conglomerates. And then the Cutler through Chinle formations. So these are Permian through Triassic formations marked by these light blues into this lighter green. Um, these are primarily terrestrial deposition and fluvial and alluvial and sometimes lacustrine environments. Um, and so these are the units that 
should say the Honaker Trail through the Chinle and sometimes up into the Jurassic are the units that were deposited during salt wall growth in the basin. Um, in addition, there's a number of key unconformities throughout the basin and we use these as markers um, when we're interpreting some of the subsurface stratigraphy between salt walls and at the margins of the salt walls. Um, so the main ones that I want you to keep in mind are the mid cutler unconformities. So that's marked by these two red arrows here. Then there's an unconformity between the cutler and the moan copy, so right at the end of the Permian through the Triassic. And then another one at the top of the moan copy into the Chinle. Um, so these are ones that we can trace throughout the basin. But in addition, there's a number of local unconformities near salt walls um, that we can use to uh, decipher some of the history of the individual salt walls. So the Paradox Basin has a, a rich petroleum history. It's one of the reasons why the area was uh, mapped in such detail and explored quite a while ago, in addition for other mineral resources. Um, so the first oil was produced in the region in 1908 near Mexican Hat in the southern part of the Paradox Basin. Um, it's mostly produced from the Paradox Formation throughout the basin. So these interbedded um, black shales throughout the, the, that are interbedded with the salt. There was a big oil boom in the 1950s, which led to a big uh, rejuvenation of mapping in the area, leading to a number of uh, beautiful maps that we use as our, as our base for how we're moving forward with our field mapping. There's ongoing exploration in the area. And um, the last time that I pulled the data, there's production right now in at least 12 fields, primarily in the southern part of the basin. So away from where we have um, the paradox, what this map calls the paradox fault and fold belt, I'm um, closer to the Uncompahgre uplift where we actually had those salt walls. So most of the production is coming from the southern part of the basin um, where you don't have as much deformation. All right, so let's talk a little bit about our research motivation before we dive into the details of Sinbad Valley. Um, so the SSIRC, the Salt Sediment um, Interaction Research Consortium has been working in the Paradox Basin for a couple years, quite a few years now, um, really focusing on using halokinetic and near diapir geometries to illuminate some of the structural and stratigraphic histories of these diapirs. Um, and so just to talk a little bit about what some of these features are around the diapirs that we're looking at and that we're going to use. Um, so here's a schematic, a schematic salt wall. This is uh, meant to be modeled after one in the Paradox Basin. And you can see we have a number of different features labeled here on different sides of the salt walls. Um, so one of the features that we use are called mega flaps. These are panels of the oldest mini basin strata that extend vertically for kilometers up the flanks of the salt wall. Counter regional faults. So these are faults which have a similar geometry to growth faults or expulsion rollovers with thickening sediment in the hanging wall closest to the fault. And the important thing is that the fault dips away from the regional dip. Radio faults. So these are faults that are uh, typically formed during diapir rise at places of high curvature. They tend to intersect the salt wall orthogonally. Salt shoulders. Um, these are expressed as faults and folds along the sides of the diapir and represent a period of erosion or where the sediment accumulation rate outpaced the salt rise rate, commonly followed by subsequent dissolution of that salt shoulder um, leading to cap rock. Secondary welds, um, which are welds that occur above the base salt weld at the autochthonous level. So this could be alloctonous welds. Um, and so in this talk, we're going to be focusing mostly on counter regional faults and mega flaps because these are the two primary features that we observed at Sinbad Valley. But um, as a team, the larger group has identified all of these features at different diapirs throughout the basin. So just to give you a few more examples of what these look like, I'm sure many of you have seen these in outcrop or seismic data um, during your careers. Um, but so mega flaps again are these panels of the oldest mini basin strata that are coming up along the flank of the salt wall. They extend vertically kilometers up the flank of the diapir. So here's an example from seismic data. 
although I think by new definitions, um, this isn't quite steep enough to technically be a mega flat. Um, but we have outcrop examples of this too. So this is an example from the Flinders Range, the Wichelina dive here in Australia, and where again we have that oldest mini basin strata extending vertically all the way up the side of the dive here. Um, and then the Gulf of Mexico has plenty of examples of mega flaps on uh, beautiful 3D seismic data. Um, here's an example that uh, Mark Rowan pointed out in his 2016 paper, um, where again, we have this oldest mini basin strata um, coming up vertically and even a little bit overturned along the flank of the dive here. Um, and then counter regional faults. As I mentioned, these are faults where we have the um, thickening of almost like a growth fault geometry with thickening of the strata in the hanging wall. And it, the fault generally dips away from the regional dip, so typically towards the sediment source. Um, and commonly we see these uh, either coming out the ends of the diapirs or linking between different diapirs. So here's an example again from the Gulf of Mexico um, where we have these, these curved faults with the, or at least curved faults connecting some of these diapirs with the sediment source here to the, to the top of the screen to the north. Um, so if we look at that in cross section now going from the northwest down to the southeast and we can see that uh, landward dipping fault with that strata thickening into the hanging wall of the fault. And so as I mentioned we see a number of these faults throughout the paradox basin. Um, so if the paradox basin has been studied so well in the 1950s and 60s um, why do we want to go back there and look at it again? <laughs> And well, A, we have a lot more data now, a lot more subsurface data, and B, we have a lot, um, a lot deeper understanding of some of the concepts in salt tectonics and what the geometries that we're seeing at the flanks of these diapirs mean. Um, and so just to give you an example of some of the great work that was done in the 50s and 60s um, that may or may not be right, but can have pretty big implications for how we interpret the, the subsurface structure of the diapir. Um, so this is an example from Paradox Valley in southeast, southwestern Colorado, um, mapped by a Cater in the 1950s. Um, so here's the Mesozoic stratigraphy on either side of the diapir. Here's the salt in the center of the diapir. And Cater mapped these um, thin pockets of Honaker trails. So that's the Pennsylvanian strata near the base of the mini basin, all the way at the in the center of the diapir dipping vertically. And so what that means when we think about that in a cross-section sense, and so now we're going from southwest to northeast across the diapir, we have the Mesozoic strata again on the northern and southern flanks with the salt in the middle, is that we have that oldest mini basin strata coming up along the flank of the diapir. And so that has implications for the subsurface geometry, how the diapir grew and what you might expect to find in terms of mineral or hydrocarbon uh, resources there. Um, so we wanted to go back and take a look at a number of these sites that seemed like they might have pretty big implications for the tectonic history and evaluate whether these geometries are um, actually, actually there. And so one of, the, one of the tricky parts is that Honaker Trail as a primarily carbonate formation um, has also been misinterpreted as, uh, as cap rock throughout the basin. So when we see this Honaker trail, these carbonates in the middle of the diapir, we ask ourselves, well, is this cap rock or is it actually a mega flap? Is it actually the strata coming up from the deepest part of the basin and exposed at the surface? Um, so that's one of our main motivations to go back and revisit Paradox Basin, try to identify some of these inconsistencies in the previous mapping um, look at halokinetic and near diapir geometries and see if we can um, learn something about the revised salt tectonic history. Um, so as I just said, our overall goal is to integrate new and existing surface and subsurface data. So we have um, a pretty dense 2D seismic line database with a number of wells, publicly available wells. To integrate that with recent advances in our understanding in salt tectonics, um, to lead to a new understanding of salt sediment interactions in the petroleum system in the Paradox Basin. Um, and the, the SSIRC has been focusing a lot on Gypsum Valley and Onion Creek and Sinbad Valley to try to build that understanding. All right, so let's move on and 
talk about Sinbad Valley and some of the detailed observations that we saw there. All right, so Sinbad Valley is a salt wall in the northeastern part of the Paradox Basin. It's a proximal salt wall. So this is the Uncompagre uplift here, Sinbad Valleys in that first line of salt walls just to the southwest of the uplift. The dive here is 10 kilometers long and five kilometers wide. It's flanked by two mini basins, the Salt Creek Mini Basin to the northeast and the Rock Creek Mini Basin to the southwest. So we explored this area using different data sets to integrate the surface and subsurface observations. Um, these are fairly old school methods and older data sets. Um, the 2D seismic reflection data is probably from the 70s and 80s. Um, and then we have well logs stretching from you know, decades back all the way to some more recent ones. Um, at the surface, we have a bedrock mapping. So we mapped the geometries all the way around the dive here. Some areas are more detailed than others. We measured a couple stratigraphic sections and conducted thin section analyses to try to understand the, the stratigraphy better. Um, and then perhaps the only newer method that we used is um, creating 3D models of inaccessible areas um, using drone imagery and then field check that against or check that against our field measurements where we were able to. Um, and really, as you'll see in some of these photos, the the terrain is quite challenging and the vegetation is quite thick in Sinbad Valley compared to areas over near Moab. Um, so using these drone models was really key in how we um, and how we were able to map some of those uh, steeper areas around the margins of the dive here. So this image here on the left hand side shows the location of two of the seismic lines that are pertinent to Sinbad Valley. So we have one across the northwestern end and then one a little bit to the southeast of the actual dive here um, where we have salt in the subsurface connecting Sinbad Valley to the Rock Creek dive here. So we can still um, be able to pull something about the subsurface geometries coming off the dive here. In addition, we had a number of wells in the area marked by these red dots, um, including one drilled right in the center of Sinbad, which I'll show you in just a second. So now we're gonna zoom into the area of this um, blue polygon right here. That was our main mapping area. So here's our detailed map right here um, with, again, the greens representing the Mesozoic strata, blues representing Perme Permian, purples are Pennsylvanian, all the way back to the pink, which is the salt. And so um, I'm going to walk through the evidence and the observations that we're seeing at different parts of the dive here. But just to give you the punchline up front, um, we identified at least three halokinetic or near dive here features at Sinbad Valley. Um, those include a mega flap on the southwestern side. So that's this panel of stratigraphy right here, with that purple being that oldest mini basin strata. Um, it contains paradox, Honaker Trail, and Cutler strata, and the dips are vertical to overturned. We have counter regional faults that are coming off the ends. We see those both on uh, seismic data and in the field. And we have intrasalt inclusions exposed in the center of Sinbad. Um, so this little schematic diagram here, which I'll show again at the end, kind of reminds you where all these halokinetic features are. It's counter regional faults coming off the ends, mega flap on the southwestern flank, and intrasalt inclusion in the center. So before we start talking about some of the details, let's keep a little high level look at, um, at what Sinbad looks like in the field and in the subsurface. So here's a photo now looking from the southeast towards the northwest at Sinbad. So we can see the, the nice valley right here um, with that, those um, Permian through Mesozoic stratigraphy coming up against the side of the dive here. Um, we can also see we have faulted, pretty faulted termination at that northwestern end, which is one thing that we'll talk about in a little bit. So let's look at a cross section now going from southwest to northeast kind of along the, the southeastern part of the dive here. So we're going from southwest to northeast with the Salt Creek Mini Basin on the northeast side and the Rock Creek Mini Basin on the southwest side. So again, we have that um, oldest mini basin stratigraphy, the Honaker Trail coming up along the flank of the dive here, all the way up to the Mesozoic stratigraphy that's just slightly upturned against the dive here versus on that northeastern side, um, we have that Pennsylvanian and Permian strata thickening into the dive here. So we're already starting to get a little bit of that growth fault or counter regional geometry here. Um, so as I mentioned, there were two wells that were drilled at Sinbad Valley. 
Uh, one of them is the Husky Hoover well that's located just on that northeastern flank. And that provided some excellent control for the seismic line in the area. Um, this well was, I think there were a few shows in the Cutler, but it was deemed a dry hole. And then someone back in the 50s decided to drill in the center of Sinbad Valley, thinking that this was a nice little anticline right here and that you might find something down in the Mississippian units. Um, and so they drilled that all the way down to, in, you know, a couple, couple uh, thousand meters. And uh, all I found was salt. So this really uh, led to the understanding in the area that these aren't just original, um, or these aren't just anticlines, that there's, they're actually salt cord. All right, so now let's spend some time talking about the details of the southwestern flank and then that northwestern termination. Um, so let's first go to the southwestern flank of Sinbad. So we're looking in this red box right here. So we conducted um, detailed mapping of this area all along the flank of it here. We really focused on the southeastern end and the northwestern ends. That's where we have the most measurements and these um, blown up maps right here in the lower left and the lower right. This area in the center was derived primarily from previous geologic mapping, although there is a, a current master's student who has mapped this area in detail um, and says that in general, the, the um, previous mapping is holding up. So all along this panel here, we have continuous uh, Pennsylvania Permian stratigraphy although the dips and thicknesses do change along strike. Um, so we were able to divide this into four structural domains based solely on the change in geometry. Um, so we'll return to this in just a second. Um, let's see. There they are, the four structural domains with uh, structural domain D being at the southeastern end and structural domain A being at that northwestern end. So, cause these are the two areas that we mapped in detail, the southeastern end, and we're seeing steep to overturn dips in the Pennsylvanian and Permian strata. And we have a pretty thin carbonate ridge section. At the Northwestern end, we have dips at the surface of only 50 to 70 degrees. And we have a thick clastic ridge section. And we'll talk more about these subtle changes um, in a few slides. So in total, this panel is about seven kilometers long. Um, and because I already gave it away in some of the previous slides, we do interpret this to be a mega flat panel along the entire southwestern flank. So let's take a look at what this um, looks like in the field at the northwestern end. So now we're standing on this ridge here looking to the southwest at the um, Pennsylvania Permian and Triassic strata. So you can see it's just great exposure in the field. <laughs> it's pretty rugged and there's a lot of vegetation. So as I said, those drone models um, really came in handy for um, mapping some of these inaccessible areas. But you can make out these steeply dipping beds um, through the trees along that far ridge line and then more gently dipping beds um, on this farther ridge, this ridge line that's farther away. Um, so we're interpreting this closer, these closer steeply dipping beds to be the lower cutler they dip between, or usually around between 50 and 70 degrees, but usually these ones closer to the dive here margin are closer to 60 to 70 degrees. Um, we have a pretty prominent change in the dip, which we're interpreting as a mid cutler unconformity. That's one of those regional unconformities. And then above that, we have a Permian upper cutler strata that are dipping more gently, followed by another unconformity. Again, one of these basin wide regional unconformities um, and then more gently dipping Triassic strata only 10 degrees to the southwest. So when we take a look at this as a whole, um, along the entire mega flap, we're seeing Pennsylvania Paradox and Honaker Trail formation and the Permian Lower Cutler group has similar dips. And so we're in similar dips and sort of similar thicknesses. So we're interpreting this as pre-kinematic strata versus the Permian Upper Cutler group we have gentler dips separated by that mid color unconformity. Um, and so we're interpreting the, the change in dip, the unconformity and some gross strata geometries observed in the upper cutler to represent synkinematic strata. So just to take a look at how different some of these sections are along strike. So here's our measured section in the southeastern end and a measured section in the northwestern end. 
Um, so we have Northwestern and section one on the left-hand side here and the Southeastern um, and section two on the right-hand side. So we can see that on the, in the classic rich section, we just have a lot of inner bedded uh, fine sandstones and pebble conglomerates with relatively few carbonate beds versus at the southeastern end. And we have much thicker carbonates. We have some paradox formation in addition to Honaker Trail and Cutler, um, but really just higher percentage of carbonates versus clastics and a much thinner section overall. And so ongoing work has suggested that um, with more measured sections in between here, that we have generally um, a thickening Honaker Trail and maybe Cutler, um, but that upper Cutler is, is uh, or sorry, Honaker Trail is definitely thickening to the Northwest, which is what we're interpreting here, um, but that perhaps the Cutler group, there's less thickness changes in that lower Cutler, but then the upper Cutler, we start to see some of those growth strata geometries again. All right, so now we've looked at what that looks like at the surface. So let's take a look at the subsurface. Um, here's a seismic line now going through pretty much the center of Sinbad Valley. We're going from southwest to northeast, so southwest to northeast. Um, because this is proprietary data, we aren't allowed to publish the actual data, so these are all line drawings. But you can see that these kind of chaotic reflector areas represent um, these areas where there is salt. And then we have these more continuous reflectors, uh, which represent the mini basin stratigraphy. And so on the northeastern side, um, we're seeing the, that strata kind of thicken with, the, with that um, growth into the dye pier. So we have that thickening strata in the hanging wall, that counter-regional geometry, versus on the southwestern side, um, we have that, those strata kind of coming up vertically against the flank of the dye pier. Um, so we can throw in our interpretation there, and we can see that we have the Honaker Trail and Cutler, again, thickening on that northeastern side versus on the southwestern side. They're thicker in the center of the mini basin and they're thinning and vertical up against the flank of the dive here. Um, and so this is just to give you an example of, of what it looks like, um, what that mega flat panel, that steeply dipping strata looks like in the field. So just great exposure all throughout to, to really nail down the geometries here. Um, but we were able to find uh, some outcrop to confirm these steep dips. So one question that arose um, as we were mapping these and putting together our data is that we do have uh, some lateral variation in the salt sediment geometry. You know, we're seeing some thickness changes, relatively minor thickness changes compared to some of the thickness changes we're seeing in the mini basins. Um, and we're seeing differences in the in the, the bedding attitudes that are exposed at the surface. And so, as I mentioned before, let's start in the southeastern side at D to D prime, we have that steeply dipping strata. So here we have the Pennsylvania Permian steep to overturned at that southeastern end. Um, as we move towards the northwest through C to C prime here, and then B to B prime here, we have more gentle dips at the surface, ranging between 30 and 50 degrees, although we are seeing some change um, between the Honaker Trail and the Cutler. Once we get to that northwestern end, we have those dips that are 50 to 70 degrees, um, but this is where we have that seismic line, so we know that these deeps are actually, or these dips are actually quite steep at depth. So we wanted to think about how these lateral variations in salt sediment geometry, the mega flap, um, could be, um, might help us uh, kind of decipher the, the kinematic story here. So we're relying on two end member models proposed by Mark Rowan in his 2016 paper um, on how mega flaps are formed and if that can help explain the different geometries that we're seeing at the surface. So one way that mega flaps may form is through limb rotation. This is where um, we're just having passive salt rise as the, the, the mega flap panel is slowly rotated into a vertical position. And in that case, we may end up with geometries where we have um, steeper dips where the mega flap panel has rotated more vertical and then more gentle dips 
where the mega flap panel maybe hasn't rotated quite as much. We can have folding via hinge migration. So this might be where um, during diapir rise, you're actually pulling that panel back through an axial hinge into a vertical position, in which case you might have more steep dips exposed at the surface and in the subsurface, and where you've already pulled that panel, that roof panel all the way back through the hinge, um, versus you might have shallower dips at the surface where you might have a little remnant of that roof panel that hasn't been pulled back through that hinge yet. Um, in this case, in order to, to remove some of the, the uh, remnant roof panel above the diaper, you probably had to have some erosion too. Um, and then how do we explain some of these abrupt changes in the geometries between different parts of the mega flap? Um, one way we can do that is proposed by uh, Escosa in his 2018 Basin Research paper, drawing on an example from Gypsum Valley, another diaper in Paradox. Um, we can have uh, radial faults that are separating these different panels of, um, of geometry of the mini basin or of the mega flap stratigraphy. So in this case, uh, you might have radial faults separating areas where you have different degrees of limb rotation or different degrees of hinge migration. Um, so in order to apply that to Sinbad Valley, let's take a look at some proposed subsurface um, geometries here. So on the left hand side, we have um, what the subsurface may look like with limb rotation. So we're having varying degrees of that uh, rotation of the mega flat panel laterally. On the right hand side, we have um, limb rotation plus hinge migration. So the example I showed you in the in the previous slide was that hinge migration was a pure end member model. At Simbad Valley, we think that there still has to be some limb rotation going on in order to get these geometries. Um, so we're calling it a combination of limb rotation and hinge migration. So in the case of limb rotation, um, at the southeastern end, we have steep dips all the way down to the base of the, of the diapir with thin tonic or trail at the surface. We might have radial faults that are separating these different panels. Um, but the, the important part here is that we're projecting those surface dips into the subsurface, which implies that there's still a, a fair amount of salt underneath that um, mini basin stratigraphy at the diapir margin. So these dips here are supported, or this, these geometries here are supported by the surface dips that we're seeing. On the right hand side, where we have limb rotation and hinge migration, um, we're assuming based on seismic data at the northwestern end that the surface geometries are not necessarily indicative of the subsurface geometries. So we might have more gentle dips at the surface, but that at the subsurface we're dipping steeply um, maintaining that, um, the, that panel of vertical stratigraphy up against the side of the diaper. Again, with different, different structural domains, perhaps separated by some radial faults. So this is just a zoom in of what the, that diapir margin might look like at the surface where we mapped it and where we have those uh, much gentler dips at the surface. So this would be kind of where the axial hinges um, with if you were to put back in any eroded sediments, they would be very gently dipping on top of the diapir here. Um, but then in the subsurface, um, you're dipping steeply. Uh, we extracted dips from 70 to 80 degrees from the seismic data. Um, so because the limb rotation plus hinge migration model is supported by both surface and subsurface data, uh, we're using the seismic data and the surface data to, to say that this is likely the kinematic pathway for mega flap formation at Sinbad Valley. Um, and so we see these lateral variations at different diapirs in Paradox Basin as well. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the Escosa paper in 2018 in Basin Research really focused in on some of these lateral variations at Gypsum Valley. Um, so this is a, located in the more distal part of Paradox Basin, still in southeast, southwestern Colorado. So at Gypsum Valley, there's no mega flap on the northwestern end, but there is a mega flap on the southeastern end that's supported by both surface outcrops and subsurface outcrops. Um, and so in this case, um, in the 2018 Basin Research paper, uh, they're proposing uh, different degrees of, of limb rotation or perhaps um, variable uh, uh, erosion or separated by, by radial faults 
um, in order to explain the lack of a mega flap at that northwestern end. All right, so let's move on to talking about the northwestern end of Sinbad Valley. So in that um, photo that I showed in the beginning, um, this is that area where we, it's pretty faulted that we saw, where we have a, a little grobbing going on there. Um, so we mapped this area in detail, and I think there's still ongoing work to try to understand the geometries in a little bit more detail. So at this northwestern end, we have two faults that form a grobbin. Um, the faults extend for eight to 10 kilometers to the northwest. The faults offset Pennsylvanian through Mesozoic stratigraphy. At the surface, we're really only seeing the Permian through Mesozoic stratigraphy, but on a seismic line, just a little bit off the screen here to the northwest. And we actually see this, this fault F2, which we're interpreting to be the primary fault, um, extend all the way down to the, to the base of the basin and sole into the, um, sole into the Pennsylvanian salt. And so this fault, the primary fault F2, has approximately 1.1 kilometers of throw on it. And we see um, some of the Mesozoic strata thickening into the hanging wall of the fault. So that suggests to us that this fault um, is a primary one and it has a counter-regional geometry. So we are uh, suggesting it's counter-regional fault coming off the end of the dive here. Um, so let's take a quick look at a cross section through there going from southwest to northeast across these faults, so southwest to northeast, um, just to give you an idea of what it looks like in the shallow subsurface. Um, so we have Permian through Jurassic strata on that south, or I should say all the way through Cretaceous strata on that southwestern side, um, with uh, that same strata dropped down a little bit into the center part of the Graben, um, and then it's a little bit higher stratigraph or higher structurally on that northeastern part of the Graben. So we have that primary counter-regional fault right here. Um, just to give you another look at what um, the excellent field exposure that we have. So now we're standing here in the center, or I should say in the center of the valley looking towards the Northwest. Um, we can see the Jurassic strata coming up against the fault, down dropped here in the Graben, um, and then a little bit higher again on that Northeastern side. And so in outcrop, we didn't really have a whole lot to go on here. We relied mostly on previous mapping and then really linking this with that seismic line a little bit to the, to the Northwest. Um, but this does appear to be a, a, a pretty major fault on the Northwestern end with a lot of throw on these um, Pennsylvanian through Mesozoic units. And so here's a, a look at the the same, what we're interpreting to be another counter-regional fault off the southeastern end. So now we're looking at a seismic line down here. We were up at the northwestern end before. So we're going from southwest to northeast, from southwest to northeast. Again, we have the chaotic reflectors um, where we have the salt walls and then the more continuous reflectors in those mini basins between the salt walls. Um, so we're interpreting this again to have be that Pennsylvanian Honecker Trail all the way up through the, the Mesozoic stratigraphy with that thickening geometry in the hanging wall um, versus on the, that mini basin to the Southwest. We have a little bit thinner strata that's thicker in the center of the mini basin and it's thinning up on there. So we're interpreting this to be counter regional fault right here that's um, soling into the, the Rock Creek dive here at depth. And so these are similar to geometries that we're seeing in other basins. Um, so here's an example uh, from a 2012 paper um, where we have this kind of a growth fault expulsion rollover geometry um, with a counter regional fault here. So a little bit different, but um, overall similar geometries. So that's why we're interpreting this to be counter regional faults. Um, so then the last feature that I'm going to touch briefly on are intrasalt inclusions. So these are non-halite units within the halite, within that Pennsylvanian salt. Um, they're deformed during diapir growth. And, um, and these features can be used to tell us something about the, um, some of the deformation that's happened within the salt, or it can be used to say something about uh, provenance or, or uh, sediment pathways during deposition of the salt. And so we have a fair number of intrasalt inclusions throughout the Paradox Basin. A lot of these are um, typically uh, uh, 
more fine-grained plastics, um, sometimes sandstones, siltstones, that are um, entrained within the diapir and are, are now exposed at the surface. So here's an example from Onion Creek, uh, where Sam Hudson had a paper in um, 2017 describing some of those intrasalt inclusions. And then there's a, a number of different types of intrasalt inclusions at Sinbad Valley. Um, here's an example of, of one of them where we have these um, siltstones and, and sandstones that are exposed at the northwestern part of the dive here. But we're going to be focused in on something that's a little bit more weird than that at the southeastern end of the dive here. And so here we are in this red box right here where we can see already there's been um, some previous mapping indicating a, a something's going on there with some stratigraphy that has some good strikes and dips on it. So we mapped that area in a little bit more detail. Um, so we can see we have the intrasalt inclusion represented by this darker pink versus the, um, the gypsum cap rock is this lighter pink in that area. And so with the attitudes that we have on here, we can see we have a couple different domains of, uh, of cohesive packages of sediment that are dipping in different directions. Um, so we went and explored one of these areas in more detail um, and tried to map out some of the facies. And in this area, we have a panel of interbedded gypsum, sandstones, mudstones, and conglomerates that are dipping to the northwest at between 30 and 40 degrees. Um, and these are different than intrasalt inclusions that we're seeing at a lot of the other diapirs. Um, these are very coarse grained. They're conglomerates. Um, sometimes pretty big cobbles measuring tens of centimeters across. Um, and then some of those cobbles contain um, Mississippian uh, fossils in them. And so we're interpreting that this is a, a conglomerate that's been um, interbedded. It's interbedded within the Paradox Formation. So deposited during the Pennsylvanian and that the source area is as the Uncompagre uplift as it initially began to rise um, in the Pennsylvanian. And I want to mention that there are similar conglomerates up at Salt Valley um, that have been presented on and published on by Don Rasmussen. So we think that these are uh, very similar. And so what that implies is that we have um, kind of early widespread uplift of the Uncompagre uplift during the Des Moinesian. I do want to mention that there's ongoing biostrat work um, and some more um, measured sections from folks at Fort Lewis College, and that we're doing some DZ heavy mineral work on some of these um, sandstones and mudstones in order to try to assess uh, timing and, and the source to nail down some of these uh, paleogeographic interpretations a little better. All right, so now we can piece together our uh, information from the mega flap and how that formed of what we're seeing with the counter regional faults off the ends and some of the timing that we're deducing from uh, the thickening strata there. And then um, what we're seeing with that intrasalt inclusion to try to come up with a rise interpretation of Sinbad Valley dive here. So we have during the Pennsylvanian, which is the deposition of the paradox, um, we had early thrusting on the Uncompagre uplift, which unroofed Cambrian through Mississippian units. Um, so that deposited this conglomerate interbedded with the salt. During the Permian, um, we had ongoing thrusting of the Uncompagre uplift, localized erosion of the Honaker Trail and reworking into the Cutler. And then we had the initial salt wall formation along pre-existing basement fault. Um, we had deposition of the lower Cutler near the uplift with that Honaker trail and lower cutler being thinned over the top of that inflated salt pillow um, and the initiation of single flap active diapirism. In the mid cutler, um, we had that counter regional fault form in response to sediment deposition on that northeastern flank with the ongoing uplift of the Uncompagre. We had deposition of the mid cutler strata near the uplift, again, still prograding southwest away from that uplift. We started to switch from single flap active diapirism to passive diapirism following the mid color unconformity. Um, and then we had those paradox conglomerates that are entrained within the salts. During the Triassic, we had thrusting cease or slow on the Uncompagre uplift. 
we had the upper cutler prograde into the basin with channels being deflected to the southwest around the growing salt wall. We interpret that we had ongoing slip on the counter regional faults and that the salt wall is emergent, but it may have been beveled by the cutler. And then we have, yeah, that ongoing counter regional fault localizing cutler deposition on that northeastern flank of the diapier and coming just off the diapiers. Um, the mega flap is halokinetically drape folded during this passive diapirism. During the mid Triassic, we have decreased relief on the uncompagrate uplift, so we're starting to lose that as a sediment source. We have a regional change in the overall uh, drainage pattern with, um, during the Moan Kopi time in the Triassic, a lot of the fluvial systems are now flowing from the southeast to the northwest, running parallel to the salt walls. Based on changes in the thickness of the stratigraphy, we still have ongoing slip on the counter regional faults, and we still have um, diapir growth, so we're still uh, uh, folding that mega flap. The top Moan Kopi based Chinle in the mid Triassic. Um, we have a little bit of sediment still coming off the Uncompagre uplift. We're again seeing some local unconformities as we have those axial channels run parallel to the salt walls. We still have continued slip on the counter regional faults, still ongoing um, mega flap formation. During the end Triassic, so the top of the Chinle. Um, we have a regional unconformity with the chinle being deposited uh, unconformably across the eroded uncompagre. We have a uh, paleo flow again from the southeast to the northwest with axial channels flowing parallel to the salt wall. We have a little bit of continued slip on the counter regional fault inferred from changes in the thickness. Um, but by this point, we're starting to see the, the, um, that the mega flap rotation has ceased. And so now if we look at it present day, um, we have the remnant Uncompagre highland, highlands. Um, the salt wall is buried by post chinley strata, so that Jurassic and Cretaceous strata. We might have minor reactivation of the counter regional fault during the Cenozoic. Um, we've, had, we've had those paradox conglomerates entrained within the salt and brought to the surface during salt wall flow. And we have that mega flap that's preserved on the southeastern side of the salt wall. All right, so using some of these really detailed uh, circumdiapir structural and stratigraphic geometries at Sinbad Valley, um, we're trying to apply some of those same lessons to, to look at these other salt walls in detail and try to um, identify some of these halokinetic and near diapir features at other salt walls. So as I mentioned in the Salt Sediment uh, Interaction Research Consortium, they've been focusing a lot on Gypsum Valley and uh, Fisher Valley Onion Creek, and now Sinbad Valley is included in that. Um, and so we've taken a brief look at a number of the other diapirs that have yet to be studied in detail. Um, but even with the, uh, the seismic data and the outcrop observations that we have, we do see mega flaps on the southwest side of salt walls on at least five salt walls throughout the basin. We have counter regional faults that are located on the northeastern side of the salt walls and they're coming off most of the salt walls in the basin. Uh, we've identified salt shoulders at the Jurassic, Triassic, Chinle, Moan, Kopi, and Permian levels as salt walls throughout the basin. And there's been a lot of really great work done on, the, on some of these salt shoulders and their formation down at Gypsum Valley by Rip Langford and his students. And then there's uh, radial faults that are coming off the ends of these salt walls. And we've identified them uh, primarily at Gypsum Valley and Castle Valley. Um, Sorry, what, what's going on here? Did it stop sharing? You're no, good. You're good. Okay. I had some update pop up, so that was um, <laughs> strange. Okay. Um, so just to give you an example of what one of these features looks like at other parts throughout the basin, um, here's mega flaps where we've identified them at five locations. on seismic data um, and in the field. So I'm sure a number of you have been to, um, to Gypsum Valley to see the, the beautiful exposure of the mega flap there that we can see on seismic data at the southeastern end, um, described in detail by Mark Rowan and Freddie Scoza in their previous papers. 
And then just some beautiful outcrop of that um, vertically dipping Honaker Trail and Cutler Strata along the flank of the dive here, um, which we can see here. So the mega flaps throughout the basin have vertical reliefs that vary from 1.7 to 3.5 kilometers, folding widths from about two to four and a half kilometers. All of them include Paradox, Honaker Trail, and Cutler Strata. Um, and the timing of formation appears to be relatively similar throughout the basin um, that you had mega flap um, initiation kickoff during the lower to mid Cutler likely associated with that, or likely can nail that down with the mid Cutler unconformity. All right, so um, key points. So the Sinbad Valley dive here has a mega flap along the southwestern margin, counter regional faults off the ends, and intrasult inclusions of paradox formation conglomerates in the center. And we we're able to use some of these geometries and some of the uh, stratigraphic and structural relationships to come up with a revised interpretation of the tectonic history of this particular dive here. Um, we're seeing similar halokinetic and near diapir features on all the salt walls within the basin. So we're uh, piecing together a story um, to see if there's a regional, to try to figure out what regional or local controls have on the uh, formation of these halokinetic and near diapir features. And so we've worked it out at Sinbad Valley and um, there's students working on it at Gypsum Valley and Onion Creek right now. And then we see significant lateral variations in salt sediment geometries. Um, we specifically focused on mega flaps in this study and um, didn't elaborate on it a lot in this talk, but we think that those significant lateral variations, um, in addition to the different uh, end member kinematic models of how you might form mega flap formation, we can also have that influenced by the original salt thickness of the sediment distribution or pathways or the degree of roof preservation. Um, and this was just a very quick brief look at some of these details. If you want to read all the nitty gritty details and look at the maps um, on your own time, you can check out our paper in Geosphere. It's called Controls on the Structural and Stratigraphic Evolution of the Mega Flat Bering Sinbad Valley Salt Wall in the Northeast Paradox Basin. And if you don't have access to it, it should be open access, publicly available. If you don't have access to it, feel free to contact me for a copy. Um, and finally, just want to give some acknowledgements. Um, our funding sources, so the Salt Sediment Interaction Research Consortium members, at the time the work was completed, um, some field assistants from Colorado School of Mines, Elizabeth Wilson and Cheryl Fountain, um, Craig Schneider and Terry Martin at ConocoPhillips for assistance in um, the seismic data interpretation, Nyla Matzler at UTEP, and then additional discussions with a number of um, other students at uh, both UTEP and Colorado School of Mines. And so um, thank you for listening. I do just wanna say that I know Moab Valley in that area gets um, all the hype because it's such a cool place to be, but really Southwestern Colorado and Sinbad Valley and Paradox Valley and Gypsum Valley are also really cool places to be. And um, I encourage all of you to go uh, take a look and see for yourself. Lots of national forest and BLM land to go camping and have fun and lots of new mountain bike trails too. Um, so if you, with that, I'll take questions. And if you have other questions, feel free to contact me at uh, my Gmail or on Twitter. Great. Thank you so much, Jesse. That was awesome. Uh, we have a comment coming in on the chat that says, excellent work. Thank you so much for this great presentation. I just can't tell who it's from because it's, um, they've uh, shortened the the name. If anyone else has Q&A, please put it in um, the box and I'll go through it and read it. All right, so the first one is from Piotr. Uh, why is there apparently no deformation of these diapirs that could be associated with compression caused by thrusting of the uncompadre block? Yeah, um, you know, that is the question that I get every time I give a talk on the Paradox Basin. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't know if we have a good answer for that yet. If there's anyone else on the call who wants to speak up and say something, I don't know if that's allowed, but um, 
I know there are other people on the call who probably have ideas about that if they want to share. Um, I think Mark Rowan has a comment. If there had been shortening after salt burial, we would ex absolutely expect to see shortening structures of that age, but we don't. My best guess is that the thrust imbricates within the salt developed during the time of salt deposition with no ongoing thrusting. So that's one hypothesis. I, I personally was thinking, well, what if all the deformation is taken up in the salt? I don't know. Um, okay. So we have another question from Carla Skinner. Did the Artex Sinbad well note any intrasalt stratigraphy that provides detail on the internal structure or structures of the paradox salt and its movement? So uh, yeah, so that one well, um, the logs are pretty incomplete and there's some um, kind of incomplete uh, mud logs, lithologic descriptions. They do note interbedded um, plastic units within there and some black shales. Mm -hmm. But from looking at it, I couldn't deduce any more information on the um, kind of deformational history of the salt, aside sure. from being that there are these additional uh, plastic inclusions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, she just added a couple comments um, that she was assuming that the well was cored and Bruce just chimed in and said that um, there was no core nor any logs that he can remember. So it's okay. Um, Antonio, oh, I'm gonna butcher your last name, Antonio. Uh, Revagalia, how do you kinematically combine the counter regional extensional fault with the reverse faults interpreted in seismic? Yeah, um, so the, the reverse faults interpreted in seismic on the Oncompagre uplift, I'm assuming. Um, he does specify, but sure. Yeah, we can go with I that. Think, and, uh, and I know um, Kate Giles and Mark Rowan and Bruce Trudgill probably, and Thomas Heron probably have some ideas if they want to chime in in the comments here. But I think the idea is that you're having kind of enough flexure of the crust that you are, um, it's just enough in order to an, initiate a uh, 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 counter regional fault in that direction. So you might have the, the load here, you're flexing the crust just enough that you're able to initiate that counter regional fault dipping in the opposite direction. Okay, yep. Yeah. Um, we have another question here from Ramon Lopez. He says, hi, Jessica, really lovely talk. Are you considering even more hypotheses to explain the lateral variations in your near salt wall sedimentary geometries? Or you just have those where the diapir are cylindrical with a nice parabolic curvature surface? Cheers, Ramon. Um, so I, at this point, I think we've been focusing on areas where we have um, uh, well preserved and exposed stratigraphy in kind of a nice uniform panel along the flanks of the salt walls. Um, there are, and maybe Kate can answer, Kate Giles can answer this in more detail, but um, I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done on understanding some of those detailed geometries at other parts of the salt wall, specifically off the ends. I mean, we did a little bit of that at Sinbad, but really like, there's a lot more detail that can be pulled out of that, especially at other salt walls um, that can help uh, illuminate some other possibilities. So I think at Castle Valley, there was some detailed work done at that Northwestern end by Tim Lawton, um, where they looked at some of those geometries and are coming up with uh, interpretations of secondary welds or, or radial faults to explain those variations in lateral geometries. Um, so the, the, the example I presented here from that continuous panel on the southwest flank is uh, we were specifically focused on mega flaps and, um, and their formation and how that might explain some of the lateral geometries. But there's certainly a, a lot that can be learned from looking at the higher curvature areas at the ends um, or even from some of the variations on the northeastern sides uh, where, where you don't necessarily have um, that mega flap story. Mm -hmm. Nizar Hamad, 
He says, well done, Jessica. Excellent talk in all caps. <laughs> Scott yeah. Kruger says, great talk. Thank you. Kamala Dean Osana says, great for a great, or thanks for a great talk, Jess. Um, another guy, uh, I think it's a man, Balut, I'm not going to say your last name. There is only normal faults in the southern margin. I expect a variation in the stress field because the salt surface is frictionless. I'm wondering what did you observe other types of faults as well? Um, could you repeat that question? Yeah. Um, so he said there's only normal faults in the southern margin. I expect that there would be a variation in the stress field because the salt surface is frictionless. I'm wondering, okay, so I think he's just wondering what other types of faults did you see adjacent to the Sinbad Valley dive here? Was it only normal faults or did you observe any other types of faults as well? Um, so I think at the larger scale, we focused on the normal faults because those are the, um, the most prominent ones with the largest offsets. At a smaller scale, especially within the mega flat panel, we did see other faults that had apparent strike slip offset, um, but uh, we didn't um, study them or map them in detail. So I can't speak as to whether that's the true kinematic sense of those faults. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's more work being done to map that area, the mega flap in more detail and try to um, see if there are additional faults that could be uh, cutting that stratigraphy. I don't recall seeing um, any any reverse faults there. Okay. Yeah, because he's he just sent in the comments to the panelists that um, there should be a variation in principle stresses as you I assume as you go around um, the cell wall. So I guess that would probably require much more detailed mapping. Yep, you're welcome. Um, Sam Haynes, he is asking, how fast do you think the salt dye appear ascended? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, uh, well, it's based on the stratigraphy and what we know with the basin that the process to form the dye appear is taking tens of millions of years. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not that's continuous or pulsed and what those rates may be, I, I don't think we've worked that out yet. Um, mm -hmm. If anyone else is familiar with the Paradox Basin and has ideas on that, please feel free to comment. Uh, we have another question from Timothy McNear. Can you talk more about uh, differentiating carbonate caprock from Pennsylvanian carbonate inclusions? I am not a geochemistry expert and that is not a uh, what I'm uh, necessarily good at. So Rochelle, you're probably actually better suited to answer that question than I am. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's really hard at Sinbad. So I, I spent some time there this fall um, being a field assistant and I was looking at where you had your one year measured sections. And I guess the key thing that I noticed is the cap rock doesn't have the fossils in it. And in all the other carbonate units, you see those, those fossils, um, but it's really difficult. I don't know if the geochem would actually be reliable because if it is like at the salt sediment interface, you would have had multiple phases of fluid flow and you would have had diagenetic alteration. And I just don't really think that right at the salt side interface, you can you know really depend on like some reliable bulk rock geochemistry. But yeah, that was really the only thing that I noticed there is what what you had mapped was as cap rock just was like structureless, basically. So yeah, it's hard though. Um, we have another comment from Hugh or Ha James. He says, fantastic, thanks. Um, Scott Kruger, I have a classic chicken and egg question. Did the sedimentation drive the initial location of the salt uplifts or did the position of the salt highs determine the sediment dispersal patterns? I have often seen both with the former dominating early and the latter dominating late. Um, so I would say that's an avenue of ongoing work in the Paradox Basin. Um, you know, we have a 
we have that extensive seismic data set that we've uh, worked out some of the um, mini basin geometries and trying to figure out where we might have these local depot centers during different times. Um, and now we're starting to couple that with some of the DZ and heavy mineral work so far at, um, I think there's been samples collected at Onion Creek and Sinbad Valley and Gypsum Valley to try to see if we can work out anything about the, the timing or the, the sediment pathways there, um, along with some paleocurrent measurements. Um, so I would say that we're still exploring both options. How do we know that there are like these basement highs? Is that an interpretation in it of itself? I've always wondered that, or can you actually see them on seismic? The basement faults, you mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. the faults that form like the, the shoulders. Yeah, you can see them on, on seismic data. Okay. The basement faults, yeah. Okay. Um, they, they've been interpreted on a number of different seismic data sets. And then I think when you're, when you look at some of the well logs that actually penetrate that deep, there are um, significant elevation differences between them okay. that would support that the, some of those offsets you're seeing in the seismic data are real. Okay. I haven't looked really at the seismic data. I always wondered that. Um, we have another question from Jafar Hassanpour. He's actually one of our speakers later on this season coming from Tehran. Uh, thanks, Jessica, for the nice work and talk. Why don't you think that the northeast side of the salt wall could be shifted depot center mini basins due to the welding of salt and progressive collapse of the original salt flanks rather than being counter regional extensional faults? Um, so I would say our, yeah, I would say that it may be a reasonable alternative. Um, I guess we, we classify them as counter regional faults uh, based on their geometries, um, but there are clearly shifting depot centers um, in the, the Pennsylvanian through the Triassic strata and even into the Jurassic at some of the other diapirs. Um, so that's certainly true. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, I'll have to think about yeah. that more. Thank you, Jafar. That's great. We have another one from uh, Bob. Oh, Bob, thank you so much for being here. He's calling in from South Australia. I've worked with Bob in the past. Is there still a tourist location in the Moab area that presents a small salt dive here as a possible astrobleam that may have been involved in the extinction of the dive peers? Oh, of the dinosaurs, not diapirs. <laughs> um, he said, sorry. Um, do you know, are you familiar at all with that like geologic site or anything? I'm not, no. Okay, yeah, me neither. I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, okay, so, um, oh, someone, David, or sorry, David Langford Bravo, he says, yes, should be in the canyon lands. So Bob, I'm not sure if you're still on, but in the canyon lands. Uh, Mark, yeah, looks sounds cool. Um, Marcus Alberts, he says, great talk, Jessica. Shameless self-promotion here. That is totally fine. I think some of my geodynamic salt tectonic models published in 2010, 2012 show the development of mega flaps. We just didn't call them mega flops at the time. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Um, David Langford Bravo, really enjoyed the talk and paper. Thanks for sharing your results. Um, oh, our friend Volute, he says he has another question. The small scale normal faults away from the uplift and they are below the salt body. Do you think that they were formed by flexural extension of the uplift? Um, so the ones down in the Mississippi and strata, I'm assuming pre pre Pennsylvania or pre paradox formation. Um, I think that that's one interpretation of them. Yeah, that you're getting these small normal faults resulting from the, the flexure. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah, this makes sense, Bob, if you're still on, I, we think you're referring to upheaval dome in the canyon lands. Um, a mark. Kafi, Kalfi, 
Thank you so very much. Did you observe diapir derived or mega flap derived elephant elements within syn kinematic succession of the mini basins? Yeah, um, so that's something that I didn't mention or dive into detail on, um, but on the northeastern flank of um, Sinbad in the Moenkopi, there's um, diapir derived detritus. So there's mm -hmm. gypsum nodules and some other stuff in there um, that I haven't personally measured and, and logged, but that's what um, is in some of the older literature from the 1960s. So I think that there's maybe um, some ongoing work there to verify that. Great. Uh, looks like we have um, another question from Chris Klingscales. The mega flaps apparently develop on the diapir side opposite of the sediment source versus the counter regional system. Is this a common attribute in other major salt basins? Can this be used as a predictive method whereby the mega flaps are opposite of major point sources? I'm assuming sed point sediment sources. Um, yeah, so we observe that in the Paradox Basin. And from my understanding right now, and maybe it's um, the thinking on it has changed, but that relationship doesn't necessarily hold true in other basins. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it always has to be on the distal side of the diapir. I think there are cases where it can be on the proximal side or on the flank, on the lateral sides, on the flanks. Yeah, I think, Chris, to answer your question, I have, a, I think when you're dealing with like a fold thrust belt, like in the Gulf of Mexico, that if you're in like a slightly different tectonic setting, um, depending on the rate of the fold and thrust belt, like how the rate of shortening that perhaps those features might be uh, accentuated more so than like in a passive system. Um, okay, and then just one last thing from Timothy McNair. He says, Fan fascinating to see the continued evolution in our understanding of salt tectonics in the Paradox Basin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, um, if I could squeeze in one last question, Jessica, of course. sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was ahead, just wondering, because you, you, in your bio, it mentions a bit about geohazards. What, obviously having something like a town like Moab on top of a diaper, what sort of geohazards would you expect in this sort of area? Ooh, or is a, that completely outside of the realm of your your research at the minute? That's a question I get asked sometimes because of my background in both salt tectonics and active wall thing. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, there's ongoing work to try to understand whether or not some of the those faults that are soling into the salt are seismogenic sources and um, whether or not they can host large earthquakes. I think the current understanding is that the ones in the Paradox Basin aren't necessarily um, large seismogenic sources, but um, they can, they do have a record of um, movement on them. Um, but there are earthquakes in that area resulting from the, um, the Paradox Basin injection well. Um, so in that sense, there is ground shaking that can happen. Um, other, other geohazards, I mean, I specifically work on faulting, but I guess other geohazards could just be rock falls and um, I guess that'd probably be the primary one that I think of there. Is that answering your question, Connor? Yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you, Jessica. Cheers. Thanks, Connor. Thank you, Jessica. If there's no other questions, we can wrap up. Um, anyone, if you think of something, please feel free to email Jesse. Her uh, email is on her slide. Or if you um, forget her email, you can email us and we'll forward it on to Jesse. But thank you so much for being here. We really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great, guys. Um, so I will likely be uploading this um, YouTube presentation shortly, maybe in another week. So if you want to share it with people who may have missed. And then um, I'm just pulling up the calendar. So in two weeks, we are having someone from Petroleum Experts, which I believe is the new um, version of Midland Valley. So Dr. Cathal O'Reilly, he will be presenting a talk called Modeling and Restoring Deformation in Salt Tectonic Settings best practice workflows. So those of you that are really into um, 3D, 2D move, this would be a great talk for you or someone who maybe is wants to learn more about the nuances of that. Um, yeah, thank you, Jesse. Thanks. Bye everyone, take care.